Greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm Larry Williams, the director of KARMA, the consortium for the advancement of research methods and analysis. Uh, and it's my pleasure to meet you, uh, to uh, welcome you to another version of Meet the Methodologist. Uh, and today it's a, a real treat to be talking to Scott Tony Dandel. Uh, and we're talking to Scott because two weeks from Friday, on November 16th, he will be here in Lincoln uh, giving a webcast lecture as part of our Karma webcast program. Uh, Scott uh, did his undergraduate work at Davidson, ended up getting a PhD in industrial organizational psychology from Rice, and then returned to Davidson where he was a professor in the psychology department uh, for several years. Uh, and uh, But he has recently made the transition to the business school at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Uh, that's the Belks College of Business, uh, where he's a full professor. Uh, Scott is known and had for his substantive research in the areas of leadership and diversity, and uh, was very active methodologically in several areas, uh, including relative importance, but over the past several years, his interest has morphed more into the area of big data, which is related to his, uh, his topic. He's an associate editor for the Journal of Business and Psychology and a former associate editor for Organizational Research Methods and a multi-time uh, contributor to Karma, so, uh, which we're very thankful for. So Scott, good to be hanging with you. Appreciate you taking the time to uh, share some of uh, the perspectives on your life and what's going on in our profession. Thanks, Larry. Happy to be here. Yep. So, um, I'm always interested in the circumstances that lead people to graduate school and particularly graduate studies in IO psychology. So how did that come about for you? Yeah, so as you said, you know, as an undergrad at Davidson, you know, liberal arts environment, didn't really know what I wanted to do and was just sort of dabbling in a bunch of different classes at the time. And I guess a bunch of different events sort of came together to sort of push me a little bit toward IO. Uh, I took a social psychology class as an undergrad that I found sort of super interesting. Um, I also was interested in economics. I really enjoyed those economics classes. I actually went to the London School of Economics uh, during the, the summer between my sophomore and junior year. Um, and, I, and I sort of saw IO as sort of a blending of those two um, interests that I had. In addition, um, I knew I was pretty good at math, um, and I was sort of counseled by uh, some other psych majors that, hey, you know what, that math skill is actually really handy in psychology um, and might give you a competitive advantage. And so that's another thing that sort of propelled me toward IO. And then a, a, an interesting thing about Davidson is, despite being a really small school, um, we have a well-defined IO psychology program. Uh, so we had a faculty member there who, um, a longtime IO psychologist, also has his own consulting business and really gave undergrads exposure to IO psychology in a way that you wouldn't maybe see that at another small institution like that. Yep. So, um, Scott, you know, a lot of people go to graduate school with, uh, with strong interest in uh, research methods and quantitative techniques, uh, but not all of them decide to get involved in research on those topics. So when did you, do you remember your first uh, project where you were actually doing methodological research and what was that transition like for you? Yeah, so that, you know, that sort of fell into my lap at, in graduate school. Um, so I was at Rice and at the time Rice was a really small graduate program. We actually only had two faculty members at the time. Um, and I guess it was about at the end of my first year, I'd taken the introduction ANOVA class, I'd taken the regression class, and the individual who taught that class, he wasn't an IO psychologist, um, but was in human factors, and he sort of approached me after those classes and said, you know, you, you've done really well in these classes, there's a guy that, you know, you might want to meet. And he's a psychometrician who worked over in the medical center. He actually um, 
was the first ever postdoc at the Thurstone Psychometric Lab at University of North Carolina. That's um, rich. Those are rich. Yeah, I know, right? And and so I arranged a meeting with him and went over there. And I guess he had a history of every, you know, so often hiring a, a graduate student to work in his lab. And we just sort of hit it off that that very first day. And he said, well, you know, do you want to come work over here? I'm doing some Monte Carlo simulation work, mostly related to um, controlled clinical trials. So they were in the medical center looking at analyzing longitudinal data, um, you know, different autoregressive correlation structures impacting that data, uh, different dropout mechanisms, so some very longitudinal um, mixed model kind of stuff. And... Uh, that's really how I got started was basically, uh, believe it or not, coding in Fortran. So we had a little Fortran program, um, and I am not a programmer um, by training. I just sort of, it's one of those things that I sort of have cobbled together along the way as out of necessity. Um, and so we had a little Fortran program that would simulate data with different characteristics, and then we would uh, sort of turn through that and investigate things like power and type one error for different analytical strategies of that data. And that's yeah. sort of how it all got started. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so, uh, so you have that part of your background. Uh, and then as I mentioned, uh, you also have uh, served in uh, an editorial capacity, both with Journal of Business and Psych and ORM. How do you think your your experience as a methodological researcher and your experience as an as an editor, how have they affected you and your research and how you approach your scholarship? Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, in in a number of ways. So one of those ways, and this is one of those things where, like, when I talk to junior faculty at some of these consortiums or on these editorial panels. Um, you know, I, I feel like I get to see stuff in its infancy, right? So I'm often reviewing or making editorial decisions about articles um, that are, are really not, especially in the methodological area that are not widely out there. So oftentimes at ORM, for example, there might be a, a piece on a methodological technique where someone's trying to share that with our community. It might be something that might be used in another discipline that we haven't really adapted or some new approach. And, you know, one of the things that I was getting to do was to see that early and be like, oh, well, I think I can apply that in this way, or, oh, I think I can use that in this other way. And I think that that perspective, sort in a lot of ways, cultivated what I do now, which is, hey, there's a bunch of stuff happening over in computer science can leverage and take advantage of in terms of, again, these are big data approaches or modern data analytic techniques. And, and so I think that mindset of thinking about like, well, what are these new things, these cutting edge things that are not as readily taught or commonly available that are out there that really can help us, you know, either do better science, um, ask new and different and interesting questions, or perhaps ask them in different ways or investigate them in different ways. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, with that, I'd like to, you mentioned it, so I'd kind of like to <laughs> do the, uh, the transition to talking about um, your involvement with big data, right? So you've co-edited the series from PSYOP Frontiers on big data work. And so I'm just, uh, as much time as we've had hanging out together, I don't think I really have had the chance to chat with you about kind of that transition. And where were you and what were you doing when like the big data hit you as something that was important and something that you wanted to be involved in? Yeah, so again, I think this is one of those confluence of different events that were happening to me that, that got me interested in pursuing that direction. So, you know, I think back, you know, it's five or six years ago now to the kind of things that, that I was doing. So one of those things, as you know, was I had sort of adapted R into my life and and so when you're in the sort of R environment, you get exposed to a lot of those conversations about big data and different techniques that I probably didn't know about. 
um, before. So that was one thing. Uh, another thing was that I was working with James LeBreton on one of our collaborative projects and it involved a pretty gigantic large-scale simulation of some data um, in the uh, on the order of really when you take all the conditions into account and all the many cases you know on the order of billions of cases and so I sort of faced with this issue of just like managing that gigantic simulation and managing that data um, at the same time, uh, you know, James and I have been pretty heavily involved in relative importance analysis and regression, and that was a, you know, was and still is a pretty hot topic in a lot of these machine learning approaches. So it's really, you know, when we think about those machine learning approaches, how do you begin to disentangle those complicated black box models to understand what the features are that might be driving that good prediction that you're getting. And, and, and so I really think it was the overlap in terms of my interest in R, um, this very practical need that I had to manage this gigantic data set and figure out how to do it, um, and this interest in this methodological technique that had a, a lot of overlap with modern prediction methods that really um, got me thinking about big data, the issues around big data, and how we might use that more in the organizational sciences. Yeah. So um, as you you made that transition uh, to work more in the big data space, so to speak, uh, you do come at it uh, from the point of view of a quantitative uh, psychologist. And your training was uh, in those traditional areas of uh, quantitative and IO psychology. So how does that, what parts of that training do you rely on in, in working in the big data area? And what parts of the training have you had to sort of backfill as big data and related techniques have emerged? Yeah, well, so I'll handle that in a, in a different order. So, I mean, I think in terms of the back building, you know, and I, and I think about, you know, new graduate students and the kind of skills they might want to think about developing, you know, the, the first one is just programming expertise, right? So, again, I'm not a trained programmer. I consider myself a functional programmer. Like, I can get stuff done, but it's perhaps not the most elegant or efficient way, um, and it probably takes me way more time than somebody who had that kind of more formal training could do. Um, and so that's definitely an area. Um, I think that we, as, as a field, tend to maybe focus on more straightforward model-driven techniques, right? So we don't really embrace many of these, again, what I just sort of lumped together in, in terms of this category of modern prediction methods um, or machine learning approaches. I know that's generic and would apply to regression as well. But um, so those kinds of things we, we were never exposed to, at least I was never exposed to in graduate school. I know that's changing a little bit. Uh, is that because so much of the focus in graduate school is on starting with the theory rather than starting with data? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all about model testing, right? It's all about, um, you know, Bremen has this great article. Um, the title is Statistical Modeling the Two Cultures and basically lays out that, like, you know, one culture is this one where it's all about starting with this model and evaluating the model, and the other one is, is really this algorithmic culture where you're starting with the data and going to build the model from that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so I think it is very, a very different perspective in terms of how you're going to approach problems. Uh, so I, I definitely had to really teach myself a lot of those techniques because um, I've never really had formal training in them in, in any way. When I think about the other part of your question, like how, how does my perspective influence how I approach these problems, I start to think about well, look, there are a lot of people out there that have training in these techniques and that are programmers and can do this work. So for me, the question is like, well, what are the unique things that I can contribute to this process 
that would be, you know, a meaningful value add. And I really do think there's something um, important about the kind of training that we get that allows us to think about these problems and approach them in a different way than perhaps, again, I don't want to be overly generic, but, you know, a somebody strictly trained in computer science might approach a problem. You know, so a, a very straightforward example might just be about measurement. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, you know, we are trained to think about measurement and what that data is actually measuring as opposed to not caring about that and really just caring that that data predicts something. You know, so obviously if you're interested in ultimately contributing to theory and you're working in a field like IO where you're making employment decisions and those kinds of things, um, that notion of, well, what is it you're measuring becomes eminently important if you're going to be sued because you're, you know, measuring something that's not job related, um, causing adverse impact and so on. Uh, so I think that that perspective is a really valuable one to have. And I think what it does is it sort of changes how we um, as a field maybe need to think about approaching these sorts of computer science problems. So an example that I might give you is I might say, okay, well, I want to predict, you know, who's going to turn over on the job, right? So my typical um, algorithmic approach to that might be, oh, well, I take everything, I feed it into some, you know, advanced machine learning approach, again, a, a random forest, an artificial neural network or something like that, and I try and predict turnover. If I were to do that with, from the perspective of an IO psychologist, well, I might change how I approach that process. So again, let's say I have like an assessment center or something and I try and predict turnover. Well, as an IO psychologist, what I might do is I might take that data from the assessment center and not try and predict a distal criteria like turnover, but actually try and predict the competencies that are supposed to be assessed in the assessment center and then use those competency scores to predict turnover. Mm -hmm. And now we have a much clearer path about, well, what it is that we're measuring in this assessment center, right? And we can say a whole lot more to our job applicants when they don't get the job. Like if we say, oh, well, why, you know, why didn't I get the job? And though again, the, the complicated explanation if you just predict turnover is, well, because the machine learning algorithm, you know, predicts that you're more likely to turn over on the job or perform worse or whatever it is, right? Um, whereas if you start to predict a competency that the, the assessment center is structured around, you could say, well, you didn't get the job because you scored lower on customer service orientation. And it's a competency that we know is related to performance on the job or turnover or whatever it is. Um, and so I think that's a different perspective that most of these applications of, again, AI and machine learning don't really take into account. They're trying to predict the ultimate criterion, and I think a way we can contribute is to think about, well, what are, again, what are the, the measurement pieces that need to be in place? Maybe we should predict those and use those to predict that more distal criterion. Yeah. Well, uh, I mentioned the book, and certainly with the book, and uh, a lot of your other activities, you've been a leader of bringing awareness of big data to the IO community, both schol the scholarly and the applied community. So what was that like in terms of the challenges of, was it hard to get people to see uh, the potential or the importance of big data, you just this whole kind of being a change, trying to be a change agent and shaping the direction of a community, which is how I see uh, to some degree what you're doing. What, what's that been like for you? So certainly not in the applied community. So I think the applied community is very engaged in this kind of work and they're doing it. And again, depending on the, the company that you're talking about, especially if you're talking about some of these uh, companies based out in Silicon Valley, they've been doing this for a while. They have a lot of data science talent. Um, and so this is nothing new for them and difficult for them to embrace. They're doing it. 
Um, I think the harder community to change in some respects is the research community because again, I do think that there is this, um, you know, really strong preference for studies done in a particular way using particular methodologies that they're familiar with and so on. And, you know, we are, we're seeing some movement in terms of acceptance of some of these tools and techniques, but we still have, we, you know, we're not seeing the wide scale adoption of them. Um, you're not seeing lots of publications appearing in our leading journals that are using some of these tools and techniques. So I think it's still a, a work in progress to, uh, to convince people that, hey, this algorithmic culture is a very useful one and perhaps should be embraced more in our literature. Yeah. Hey, so um, mentioning the role in the, the applied community, so you had a, a, a nice uh, sabbatical uh, experience, as I recall, uh, that in this particular, allowed you to grow some in this particular area. Could you share a little bit about what that was like for you? Yeah, so, you know, during my sabbatical, I, I did a, a bunch of different things, just trying to really um, interface with some of the analytic tools that different companies were using. Um, perhaps the, the biggest experience I had was with Intel. Uh, I got to work a little bit with their um, human talent analytics team. And, you know, I think that the most interesting to, thing to share about that experience was the team itself. Like the team itself was just absolutely fascinating. Uh, so the team that I was on, there was me, there was a PhD in political science, a PhD in physics, a PhD in sociology, a um, master's in data science, and a PhD in computer science. And that was the talent analytics team based in their HR group, right? So in some ways, it was super fascinating because I was the only one with HR background uh, working on those projects. So at least I had something to contribute, which was good. Um, but it was just, you know, really interesting to work with that team and see sort of how they would approach a particular problem and the concepts that they would draw from um, to think about issues, you know, even things as simple as like diversity. And it's like, well, how, you know, we know how we measure diversity, but how does the physicist think about, you know, diversity and, and what would be the, their approach to doing it? Um, and, and so I think that was very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, part of the reason we're doing this is because of your uh, webcast that's uh, November the 16th. Can you kind of give us a preview of uh, what you're going to be talking about? Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, sort of a, a primer on text mining and the organizational sciences. So I'm going to try and uh, walk you through some, you know, basic text mining tools that you might be familiar with and then start pushing those to the next level where we start talking about things like, well, what is natural language processing? What are some ways that we might be able to leverage that? Um, and my, my whole talk's actually going to be based around some actual data. So I'm going to going to use a, a real data example to say, okay, I've got this data, this massive amount of text data, and what I want to do is I want to understand what's happening in the data. So what are the different tools that I could use to sort of throw at that to try and understand what's happening in this data? Yep, yep. Well, we are, are very much looking forward to that. Uh, as we close, I want to remind, uh, either inform or remind viewers that uh, we're very excited to have you involved. Uh, not only with the webcast, but up in our upcoming Karma Short courses uh, at the University of South Carolina, January 10th to the 12th. Uh, as you know, those are all focused on the use of R in uh, organizational studies, and you're going to be doing uh, contributing in two ways, doing a basics of R workshop as, as well as your normal a two and a half day introduction to our short course. And then we have basically a total of seven courses uh, that hand focus on the use of R in various uh, data analysis uh, uh, contexts. And so we're very excited to have you involved with that. And as always, are very appreciative of all that you do for the profession and, uh, and even more so all that you do for karma. So I'm looking forward to showing you a good time in Lincoln in a couple of weeks. 
And uh, thanks for hanging with me this morning. Enjoy your day. Happy Halloween. Thanks, Larry. Appreciate it. All right. Take it easy.